Hello, today I'm reviewing Robert Swindell's 1993 novel Stone Cold. The story is told by two narrators who both use pseudonyms. One calls himself Link and implores us to do the same. He's raised in a difficult home which becomes insufferable after his father leaves and is replaced by a despicable stepfather. Link leaves home, stopping occasionally with his sister and her boyfriend until he too becomes resentful. Link then heads to London, primarily to avoid the judgment of local people who know him and resent his homelessness. People up there haven't got used to beggars yet. They're embarrassed. They'll make large detours to avoid passing close to you. And if somebody does come within earshot and you ask for change, they look startled and hurry on by. Our second lead calls him Shelter. He's a former sergeant major who resents the people he claims are dragging the country down. He sets about murdering homeless people in London. When he arrives in the capital, Link briefly lives in a house with an unpleasant landlord. When his money runs out, he's homeless again, and after being accosted by another person sleeping rough, he crosses paths with Ginger. Ginger shows Link the ropes, how and where to beg, basically. Then they cross paths with Shelter, and shortly afterwards, Ginger disappears. While looking for Ginger, he meets Gale, and they begin a platonic relationship, with him basically passing on Ginger's wisdom to her. Eventually, a big issue seller called Nick puts a few pieces of evidence together, and Link and Gale stake out Shelter's home. Link is left alone after the two of them squabble about standing in the rain. Shelter had bought a cat in order to appear harmless, and it works. He's crooning over his pet, lowers Link's guard, and he follows him into his house and is attacked. Their fight is ended by the police, and Gale is revealed to be an undercover reporter investigating the homeless in London. The book ends with Link resentful of her and her leaving him to his lot, and Shelter taken away by the police to his. The book is written specifically to be a school book. As such, it is fairly short, 132 pages of a sizable, well-spaced typeface, and there's nothing here unsuitable for a tween or above. That, in itself, presents a slight issue, sanitising somewhat a text about a serial killer preying on the homeless and burying them under his floorboards, and cleaning up somewhat the issues of homelessness, as well as eschewing the substance abuse that often goes with that. The text is, of course, a slight propagandising of the issue as well, which, when writing for children, is not really very pleasant, but homelessness isn't a particularly controversial subject. I'm sure we all agree that these people need help, even if there are disagreements in the form that that help should take. Ling is, of course, utterly blameless for his particular circumstances, but there are members of his family that aren't. His mother and his sister offer some but limited help, given his circumstances, but the novel would rather point fingers of blame at government institutions or the people that would rather walk by beggars than give to them. And there are local people and organisations trying to help, one of which is mentioned in the book, The Big Issue. Nick is a big issue seller and doing better for himself than Ginger and Link seem to be, despite Ginger's supposed know-how. Yet, why don't they try and sell The Big Issue too? They don't even consider it. For me, in Ginger's position as the oracle of the homeless, I'd say to Link, give it a try. Is the reason he seems so dismissive of the big issue because Swindells promotes a different charity crisis at the end of the novel? If so, that would be quite alarming. And I rather hope that it's only my inflated cynicism that's talking there. And, and don't confuse that with me preferring one charity over the other. Do what you please with your money and you do have plenty of options. Back to the book. Our two leads do have distinctive voices. Link is generally more well-spoken, preferring, yes I counted them, generally longer sentences and longer words. Shelter dots the occasional militarism into his idiolect, but it also is generally more matter-of-fact, less descriptive. Swindles does a pretty good job maintaining two distinctive voices, though there are occasional passages where the lines blur, usually through repeated idioms or slang. The issue, again, is that audience imposed limitation. School texts can't contain certain words, generally the same words that are banned in YouTube videos, but I'm pretty sure that drill instructors that bellow by golly at every slight or imperfection are pretty thin on the ground. The book, additionally, it does contain some mild swears. So again, you start to wonder where the motivation comes from. To be able to propagandise appropriate young people, do you need to make sure you only use two mild swears, that three is the limit and gets you banned from schools? And when Link tells a photographer, one more word from you and I'll ram that fozzing camera right in your stupid face, any 12 or 13 year old will see through the ruse as well. The issue is relevant and harmful to both realism and immersion, as does the suddenly poetic Link's reflections on the callous nature of his punters. I blunted the point of my own sensitivity in the flinty soil of their indifference. Remember as well that this is happening in London, and I already read you a passage that came from where he was before, I think in Bradford, before he came to London, so you can see that you would think that he would have done that in the previous location, but apparently not. But again, 
this is clearly an author losing sight of character and slipping into being an author is obviously too wordy for somebody to be using as dialect. However, I will say that both characters are done pretty well. Link is personal enough to want a better outcome for him, and Shelter works well enough as both Madman and the source of occasionally odd witticisms. The fringe characters get treated a little less well. There are one too many 100% bastards, such as Link's father, stepfather, his sister's boyfriend, the London landlord, and the Scouse gentleman who robs him the first night of sleeping rough. There are all sorts of hints at other problems facing homeless people, particularly from other homeless pe people, yet Swindle's message requires omitting the cause while playing up the danger. Nick is introduced as the paper seller, tapped up for information when Ginger goes missing, but only given a name on his third appearance. While no doubt there is some intended commentary on homeless people being nameless, it's not as well done as your English teacher will probably try to tell you that it is. Neither of the narrators use their real name, though Shelter is not homeless. Mostly the homeless people are known by nicknames, Ginger, Doggy Bag, etc. But some get their real names after the death, like Toya, but Doggy Bag doesn't. Gail, the undercover reporter, does introduce herself and uses her real name straight away, but it's a real name, not her real name, which is only revealed later on. Link's landlord at the bedsit, not homeless. He never gets a name either beyond the nickname Ratface that actually Link gives him. Some characters are named on introduction and some not. Link rarely asks anybody's name and Ginger never introduces anybody either. As the source of most of the nicknames in the text, you can even argue that Link is the source of much of the name stripping. In truth, if there's commentary here at all, you can find an argument against it as much as you can for any presented example. And if your English teacher tells you otherwise, just nod and say yes and know that you're right. Nick's sudden naming feels to me more like an author writing something that turned out differently to what was planned and then not going back and fixing the original introduction. And I'm pretty sure that it wouldn't be that difficult to fix because big issue salesmen I'm pretty sure have to have a name badge that identifies them as such. And regardless, Ginger is supposed to be this guy that knows most of the community. He knows where Nick lives, but he doesn't introduce him. In terms of the nameless, Nick is a further anomaly. There's no real reason for his sudden naming or his initial lack of a name when he's technically homeless, but we also know that he does have a roof over his head, albeit a squat. Additionally, it's a minor detail, but it also seems really unlikely that he would remember verbatim a conversation he overhears on a train or bus station. Gail as well is far too glamorous, her solo trips to the phone booth too regular to not give her second identity away. It's also telling that Gail too leaves Link to his lot in the finale despite the supposed bonding on the streets, though with the book's final condemnation of the system being that prisoners get a roof and the homeless do not, I think it says more about Swindell's personal agenda than anything else. Maybe that's my own cynicism from having observed government schemes that don't have the intended consequences but usually lots of unintended ones. The rhetoric tour de force of chapter 8, where Link tells how cold, dangerous and unpleasant sleeping rough is, will likely make you think twice next time you walk by somebody selling a big issue at the very least. It's highly emotive, even if you've read the same rhetoric textbooks as Swindell's. Overall, Stone Cold is a decent enough book for its audience. I'm pretty sure older teens will prefer the more grisly and real efforts of Karen Slaughter, Patricia Cornwell and company, or the bombastic fare of Martina Cole and her peers. Hopefully they'll then move on to some Thomas Harris. But Stone Cold isn't really about a serial killer. The back cover promises something more adult and thoughtful when it suggests that Link investigating the mysterious disappearances of his peers feels a sickening sense of foreboding, but that never really happens. And in truth, the book is really about getting school kids to think about homeless people. And though it does it in a slightly one-sided and definitely simplistic way, that is still a good cause for people to think about and care about. Tacking on a pretty good story with a likeable protagonist is just a bonus, really. Despite the cynicism it displays in transmitting its message, this is a decent enough book with an interesting dual narrative and school kids are likely to read far worse. To anyone not forced to read it, I'd suggest all of those authors I just mentioned as better places to look for a good read. This one is short enough to be read in a day, and if that's one of your requirements when selecting your next read, that might well swing this one your way. Thanks for watching. Like and sub if you want. See you in the next one.